Hi, welcome back to the Tokyo Show with your host, Nicholas Pettis. Today, we're doing Chapter 7 of The Blue-Eyed Samurai. Hi. Life in the dorm. So things had started to find their own rhythm, and I was getting used to the food and the rhythm of the day. Even getting up in the early in the morning had its own kind of charm. The basement was the locker room where they had these two heavy bags for self-training. But as a first-year student, you weren't allowed to use those bags. So it was always like sneaking in a kick here and there when no one was watching. <laughs> it was kind of funny. Um, yeah. Anyway, my toe had healed up and I was back in training. I still couldn't run, but I was riding the bike in the mornings. And I had gone to Minami Senpai, head of the dorm, and asked permission to lift some weights as I couldn't join class. So I'd actually gotten permission to lift weights there. So that was great. Um, it was good because it could clear out your head uh, when things got kind of, you know, whatever they are. I thought myself very lucky because this gave me an opportunity to work on power, something I had always been lacking. I figured that I would be able to gain some more weight, which would also help me beat the others, something I wanted to badly. I've had some really interesting entries in my diary that state something similar. I used to write a diary back in the day and... Um, very, very private. It was so private, I wrote it in Danish so that no one could, you know, sneak in and read it after. Um, but there were some uh, some mixed emotions in there, that's for sure. Uh, living in the dorm was like living in a very small prison. Everyone would be sleeping together and sharing everything. Even the smallest things became important. For example, during breakfast, Judd would not use the little plastic bag of soy sauce on the natto, the fermented beans, uh, which is quite yummy. I love natto now. Um, and it was just... The, the tiniest little things. What I'm trying to explain here is that every morning he would put um, soy sauce from the bin and not use the little bag of soy sauce that comes with it. And for some reason that I cannot explain, it just really annoyed me. <laughs> That's just crazy. Um, uh, also, where you sleep inside in the big room would be a battleground. All the foreigners had their their own territories, kind of where they had their beds. Second year senpai is obviously different, but for first years, it's like you get chucked over wherever there's space for you. Uh, there were so many of us in the dormitory back then that the futons would be overlapping each other. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it was really a, a <laughs> an intense place to lie and sleep in. If you were like rolling over from one side to the other side, you would bump into someone for sure. To me, as a newcomer, uh, it looked like some kind of defense mechanism against the reality of the life everyone had to choose. The more hours a day that you slept, the less you had to live with the facts. And I hated it and their attitude because all they had given into was that they were foreigners. Oh, here we go. Here we go. All right. So I'm just going to get in properly here. Yeah. So. Like I said, um, uh, this chapter is about me dealing with a lot of the frustrations that comes by living in a dorm uh, in such close quarters uh, and also being like the hierarchy. So you really are the Kohai in this situation. Uh, I wasn't strong enough to beat anyone at that point. So it was really like just had to do and deal with everything that it went on. Um, and it was like super jealous to see that other people can be like sleeping like so my uh, senpais were were sleeping on their on their futons all day long basically when they were not doing anything either reading books or sleeping or just generally lying down but we had to sit in seiza um if someone came in we had to stand up and say us and then the senpai would say yo yo uh, and then you you would have to sit in seiza and then the senpai would ah didak yo you have to tell you three times before you could actually relax and sit with crossed legs um so first year uchideshi was <laughs> yeah if you didn't have anything to do you didn't want to just like be spending time in the big room because the senpais would be running in and out of the room big big room all day long and every time someone ran in or ran out you had to stand up and say us uh it was pretty uh pretty intimidating um and then uh, this is how this is how I saw it back in those days. Uh, Judd and Liger were still complaining about the workload and having to train at the same time. I couldn't figure it out. Um, I had come from Denmark just to train and become the best I could be. And here I was surrounded by guys who were complaining about the life that they were having. I gave up everything um, and just to do this and wanted it more than anything else. I have to admit it. Uh, it would have been easy just go along with the received wisdom that I was just another foreigner and... Uh, wouldn't know any better. I am sure that is what, uh, but I'm sure that that is not what Solsa would have wanted. So I tried to force myself to look for things to make me different from the others. Now that Todd had left, thank God for that, uh, it was down to me and Mahashi to make a difference and make up for all the wrongs that Todd had left behind. So I was working extra hard. Lago used to tell me to stop using the vacuum cleaner because he wanted to sleep, but I just went ahead and did it because I knew it was the, I was doing the right thing. 
Yeah, so, you know, if you're not given an assignment, uh, just figure out something that you can do to make yourself, for one thing, busy, and also just, you know, to, 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 to keep showing that you're proactively, like, trying to do the right thing as a new tradition. For me, this was super important. Um, during some of the free time I had, I, I started to read some books, uh, most fantasy novels, like Lord of the Rings. I'd only read it in Danish and wanted to enjoy it in English. Uh, before coming to Japan, I had been the only one in my family who hadn't re uh, really been reading books, and I just never had the patience for it. Uh, obviously, I don't have a lot of patience for reading this book either because I keep going off track. <laughs> Uh, books become a reality escape uh, because once you had opened the pages you can it immerse yourself in the lives of the characters and in the novel and you forget what's going on around you and for a brief time you're in another world I especially enjoyed the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant the Unbeliever by Stephen Donaldson which is a great saga it's six volumes of like 600 pages each and um, I think I spent uh, a whole year uh, reading those books it was amazing books uh, Stephen Donaldson is a fantastic author I have found that reading is quite extraordinary. It gives you a sense of living without the physical needs of your body. It proves to me that the mind is really everything you have in this world. Right now in my life, I have uh, broken my leg quite severely and I am forced to slow down my extreme active life. And although I would love to be able to run in the great outdoors, I am not downhearted for I have freedom of my mind. Um, so to give that content uh, a little bit extra feed there uh, so what happened was i fought in 2002 in uh, k1 and i had a, a super fight against sergey gur from uh, russia and uh, in the second round i went in and, and i kicked him in the leg so hard that my shin snapped in half uh, literally it went just like that um, and I remember this is the most bizarre thing that ever happened to me in my life, I think. Um, I was leading the fight in the first round. I was doing really well. Um, just controlling him. I had like kicked him sometimes on the low kicks and stuff. And, and it was just like... Um, it was actually a fairly easy fight up until that. Uh, I'd hurt him in the first round. So I knew he was hurt because he came out and s switched to Southpaw when he came out for the second round. I knew that all I really had to do was kick him on that leg. Uh, and then I would be able to take him out. But... Um, I think halfway into the round, I was just kind of showcasing some flashy kicks and stuff. Trying to get the crowd excited also. Also trying to get myself a little bit excited about the whole thing. And uh, having, trying to have some fun at the same time. And then I was like, okay, this is now getting a little bit uh, tiring. So I was like, in my mind, this is what I think. Okay, now I'm just going to kick him with everything I have and take that leg down. So I step across and um, kick him really, really hard with my right leg. And since he's standing southpaw, his... Uh, his right knee is then, uh, uh, he pulls his right knee up to block the leg. leg and I hit it right there on um, what they call Benke no Tokoro, which is the hardest part of the shin, uh, just below your knee. Um, and the, the, the shin just snapped. Um, and this was then, uh, for me, like a very traumatic time in my life where I, I had to go through, uh, yeah, man, uh, 10 months uh, of rehab for one thing uh, to get back to light running again and sparring and stuff like that and then the first day I sparred I went in and um, I broke it again <laughs> yeah so this is uh, really what happened um, so then it took me uh, a year uh, more uh, to get over that injury completely before I really trust that leg again I didn't fight uh, professionally again for three years and six months but that's not because I wasn't ready it's because of politics in Japan um, and I had to go overseas to start fighting but that talk is for another story um, so yeah I'd broken the leg and I just decided that if I could use my mind um, to relive some of the the times in my life that when I was a nutritionist and just write it down that this was the chance I could do Anyway, uh, during the day, we could hardly ever see any of the senpais, except for the occasional one who would be on duty in a dorm. He would be crashed out on the floor somewhere waiting for the intercom to buzz, and then he would fly down to the first floor and pick it up and do whatever he was asked to do. The intercom would go off most days about every five or ten minutes, so the senpai on dorm duty would never really get any rest either, or neither would I. Every time he would get up, I would have to get up and greet him and stand him and then sit down like I just explained to you guys before. Oh, I mean, it was hilarious. Um... Seiza is when you fold your legs under you and you close your fist on the sides. We start each class in Seiza and finish it in Seiza. It is a classic sitting position of martial arts. If he remembered uh, to tell me to relax, then I could cross my legs uh, for if I got his approval. Um, finally, he would then tell me to relax the last time and then I could actually, instead of sitting like this, I would be able to sit my hands uh, in front of me like that. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a completely different lifestyle when you start living on the floor because you know, growing up with chairs and everything, like this position I'm sitting in now is how we sat down all day long uh, when we were sitting in the dorm. 
anyway this process of standing up and <laughs> like all day long like when some senpai gets called down to the intercom he runs out you stand up and say Os! and then when he comes back in you're like again Os! so there's a lot of osing going on as a first year that's for sure um, everyone wanted to become strong and everyone had their own opinion of what was best for them for example Mukaram and the others would not want me to greet them as senpais but they would uh, but they would still uh, exercise their rights as a senpai when it came to food or drinks it was weird yeah this was uh, another thing you got to think about back in the day none of the foreigners were called senpai or shihan or anything like that so uh, we were called nani nani san like so nikura san or uh, yeah, jado san or or whoever it was right uh ne san san or mokaramo san uh, like that and so I found it very strange. I couldn't understand why when we are going through the same training, we're doing the same test. And if we are even stronger, then why would they be just calling us Nani Nani-san? Uh, it's not rude. Uh, it's not even racist. It's just it's just the way it was. Um, but when I got my black belt, I made sure that everyone called me Senpai. And I think I changed the system in Hombu uh, after that time. So everyone started becoming uh, greeted as their proper um, you know, a rank. Like, for example, uh, no, Shihan Howard Collins uh, came and stayed with us for a month at a time. And um, he was also just called Colin Zhang. And, and for me, it was like completely uh, bizarre, to say, to say the least. Um, but I changed that. Uh, so uh, sometimes there would be leftovers or beef patties of curry or something that you can cons considered as a treat the next morning especially when you're trying to gain weight and you just want to eat anything you can get your hands on uh yeah it's kind of not fair anyway these leftover dishes would also be put down on the first year's table and we were expected to eat them i always hoped that it would be leftovers but every time there was something nice judd and Ligo would waltz down and deliberately pick out the good bits and then mahasha and i would be st stuck with the crappy stuff this is just the way it is it's like that in the in the sumo uh, and everything like that um but it's really uh, it's really a strange uh, humbling experience because you feel like someone's really stealing from you um yeah it's i don't understand it though uh some days i just wished i could stand up and beat the crap out of these boys i swore to myself and i wrote down in my diary in danish that i would get revenge one day and that they will all regret that they treated me like an animal okay this is a little bit excited <laughs> although it was a part of the process of being a kohai i still felt it was wrong for the senpai to be able to exercise this senior rights in anything but a karate related matter yeah so yeah if you're in the dojo and you're doing something that's got something to do with karate or you're being teed or the teaching or, or being taught or whatever it is then i i completely agree to this ocean station where you just say us to everything uh but when you're living with someone and it comes down to food it's like i tell you your priorities they shift really fast yeah um judd had some kind of connection with a supplement maker called musashi i managed to figure out that they would supply all the uchideshi with supplements as an experimental sponsorship now these supplements would come in a box every three or four months and it was supposed to be for all the uchideshi but the japanese didn't know about it and i never heard about protein powder or aminos or anything of the sort so i didn't really know what to think about it literally it's true i didn't even know what protein powder was when i got here uh, but Judd and Ligo kept telling me how great this stuff was, uh, how it could transform you into a better fighter and how it would give you more energy and power. And they kept going on and on about it, uh, like it was the best thing in the world. Um, after hearing this kind of talk for about two months, you start believing it. Yeah, I mean, supplements, it's probably a thing. Uh, even to this day, I don't do supplements. Um, I just eat food. But uh, yeah, back in those days, it was like anything you could get your hands on. You just wanted it if it's going to make you better, right? Uh, for about too much you start believing it before long you start to think that without this stuff you might as well not train this is all wrong i've done quite all right so far and would continue to do so for a long time to come after that however the promise that they would let me have some of the next shipment got me quite excited about trying it out and getting the first exposure to supplements ever Woo! <laughs> i make it sound like it's almost steroids or something <laughs> anyway it started one afternoon down in the basement and i was just finishing lifting some weights there was a man called ronan katz who's now uh, a fantastic teacher in israel uh, i hope you check this one out because this story ronan uh, we will never forget <laughs> yeah so um he i think he's a branch for israel yeah yeah even today i still consider him to be one of uh one of the only honest and true foreigners i met during my stay as a nuchideshi he was jumping this uh, thick uh, see-through plastic rope that he had brought back from Thailand and then he was doing some rounds on the bag. He was a black belt, by the way. 
So he was allowed to do that self-training at the dojo. Uh, I was trying to figure out how to lift weights correctly, and as I honestly didn't have a clue. All the time, Ronan was seemingly doing his own thing, but actually he had been having uh, a ball uh, just checking me out. He could tell that I was way out of my league and trying to figure out what the hell he was doing, what the hell I was doing. So as he was still working on the bag, I sat down and watched him do his routine. I've always been interested in watching other people doing their workouts because it shows me the way they think and react. And after a while, he came over and sat down on the bench and said, Hi, I'm Ronan. You look new around here. Are you living in the dorm? Oh, I'm Nicholas from Denmark. I am here for three years. Uh, you don't know much about weight training, do you? So he said laughingly. <laughs> Uh, I can see, uh, I can show you a few things, but then you're on your own. Uh, first, if you want to change that skinny body of yours, you're going to have to start taking some protein powder or at least aminos. Os, what's protein powder? <laughs> oh, this is hilarious. He just looked at me and then he started laughing. You mean to tell me that you don't even know what protein powder is? And then we, we got engaged in a two-hour long conversation about weight training and supplements and all, the, uh, all those kinds of things. Uh, I felt now like I knew some of the stuff that the others had known um, and it just wanted me to get the supplements even more. Uh, I asked if I could join them in their weight training and to my surprise, they let me in. I was just about to do, ready to do anything to gain strength and weight. So after a while working out with the other foreigners that afternoon, the box of supplements arrived. The intercom buzzed as usual and the box came through the window between the dojo and the dorm. Judd and Ligo tore open the box and split the contents right down the middle, right there in front of me. They didn't even look at me or offer me any of their supply. I didn't say anything because I had seen the look in their eyes. I knew that that was... Um, I knew that I, I, I knew them for what they were right then. Uh, it really was every man for himself. Judd tried to give me one of the smallest uh, containers, but LIGO made it, made it sell it to me. To this day, I don't know why I paid 3,000 yen for a small container of some awful tasting powder, and I don't even know what it was. I guess I wanted to beat them at their own game, and this was my only option. Yeah, man. They tricked me out of uh, 3,500 yen <laughs> for a sponsored. Uh, yeah, that's pretty... Uh, pretty intense man uh it is a place like there's a doggy dog and there is no one on your side you have to make it for yourself because there no one wants to help you the japanese look at you like you're just freeloading and not uh, doing your part of the job uh, <clears throat> and they would rather have you leave so that was more place in the big room the other foreigners look at you like you're a threat to them and their relationship with Sosa. if you could uh god forbid become stronger than them and get Sosa's attention so in the end um they would also rather have you leave yeah there was this uh weird um race to be the first foreign Uchideshi to finish it. But I mean, Mukanamo was in the third year. I mean, he was going to finish it if he had just, you know, kept up with his, his proper training and stuff like that. Um, anyway, they all wanted to be the first foreigner to graduate from the dormitory. If nothing serious happened, uh, this would be Mukanamo because by the time I showed up, he had already been living there for almost two years. He could have made it uh, if he was not for the fact that he was incredibly lazy. Mukaram was one of the most talented karateka I had ever seen. His technique was awesome and he knew his kata and basics. In fighting, he had that kind of timing and eye for catching the moment, which I have sel seldom experienced uh, in all of my time of karate and training martial arts. But he had no heart for hard training. He, uh, he had no real heart for fighting and so he never made it. I figured uh, he just got sick of it all. Um, he had spent too long in secluded world with no friends and the Japanese always telling him what to do. Uh, somewhere down the line, he got sick of it in his head and he started to you know, cheat on himself. And in cheating himself, he cheated on everybody, uh, is my opinion. He was a bad boy from the beginning. He came from Nice, France, and I'm sure uh, he had been up to no good back home. Judd always used to joke about him that he would never finish the program and end up back in, 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 in prison in France. Uh, I saw him as a bad boy, but with a good heart, actually. Um, the things he, he did... Uh, never really hurt anyone. It was just that he was sick of everything and needed to get some kind of relief or more likely some kind of escape. At times we all wanted to go home because it's not the ideal life to be leading, but there was one thing that kept us all there and that was Sosai. He was higher than anything else in our whole worlds. He stood there on the top of the mountain ruling with a firm arm and we were his direct students, the envy of the whole world. We got to train with him and eat with him and he spoke to us and that is what kept us Uchideshi. That is what kept us as Uchideshi's there. That day in the dorm, uh, when they sold me a bottle of Amino, I lost it a little bit for them. I swore that I would never be like them. I started to find time on my own where I could lift weights and otherwise dedicate my free time to getting better and stronger. Before long, it was like there was a kind of rift in the dorm between us. We would socialize because we lived together. Um, and there was no avoiding it. But in training, there was always a very distinctive rivalry which actually turned out for the better because of the rivalry amongst us we all grew especially me 
Um, Mukaram was always uh, cheating. <laughs> was <laughs> yeah, Mukaram was always uh, also a cheating kind of guy, but he was open about it, and you knew he was rotten because he would tell you. This is the reason for me saying uh, I felt his ways were kind of innocent because they all came directly back to hurt himself. It was really funny. Uh, it turned out that Mukaram had spent quite a lot of time on the science of weightlifting, and he took me under his wing. I needed instructions badly, and he needed someone to change uh, the plates for him. We spent the next six months uh, together lifting and improving. Uh, during this time, he gave me the basic insight of weight training, and for that, I am forever grateful. The thing with Mukaram that he could not deny his nature. You know, he was a kid that just... He was just stuck, you know. He was a, he was a kid lost in his, inside his mind and lost inside himself, and um, and he didn't want to train hard. He liked the weight training and stuff like that, but you know he would just fake all the training in the dojo, and just making a, an appearance. You know, he ended up. Um, I'm not sure if I say this here. Yeah. Um, he, he was pretty cunning, yeah, that's what it says. And Sosa would always do a good, in, in front of Sosa, he would always do a good ki and put on a good show. And then he would go to great lengths to get out of training. <laughs> ah, man. Yeah, he would, uh, he would come up with the funniest things to just like, you know, get out of training. He would literally wake up in the morning and go over to the dojo uh, for the morning training and uh, like just like show up and pretend he was going to do it. And then while everyone was outside running for three, four kilometers and doing push-ups and squats and the knuckles and outside on the concrete, he would be sleeping on the bench. <laughs> uh, he was just so lazy. It was amazing. Um, I probably get to that point at one point. Uh, this is the chapter of end, at the end of chapter seven. But uh, to round up the story about Mukaram, he ended up getting kicked out of the dorm three weeks before uh, he graduated, and that's why Judd Reed is the first foreign Uchideshi for Solsa ever. Thank you guys for enjoying uh, chapter seven. We'll be back next time. <laughs>